Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produced groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 award ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, buyer multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I'd encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Wando and the team at Catalyst 2030 for this important discussion. We're so honored by your presence today. And we know a few more people will join us. Uh, but these sessions are being recorded, uh, so many more people will listen after the session. It's been an amazing few days of Catalyzing Change Week, and I know the team has planned many, many exciting discussions. So thanks for joining us. I am honored to have some dynamic women uh, who I'm going to be engaging with today on the panel. Um, I've known each of them personally for many, many years and really inspired by their work in the ecosystem and delighted that we can discuss such a critical issue about changing narratives when it comes to Africa. I'm delighted to introduce Nkiru Mwaki, Mwaki and myself. Um, I know my pronunciation around the uh, Mwihaki's name is not perfect, but I apologize in advance to all the East Africans in the room. Okay, so we're gonna be discussing changing narratives about Africa. And these three dynamic women have been doing just that through their work, through their community, through their engagement. Um, and I would love to start off by just asking them to just introduce themselves briefly and their work in changing narratives and their impetus for engaging in this space, is what they've been able to achieve so far. So let's start with you, Moki. Um, just tell us a bit about your journey um, and most recently your dynamic and amazing work with Africa New Filter. I was hoping to go last, but never mind. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And actually, I also want us to um, acknowledge you, Inko, for the work you do to change narrative, particularly in the food space. But a little bit about me. Um, I run an organization called Africa. Narratives, um, some of the stereotypical narratives that still persist about Africa today. Um, and because we understand how narratives evolve, they evolve through stories told over time, which ladder up to a single belief. And that's the narrative. And we've identified that there are a couple of narratives about Africa that we do need to change, that Africa is broken, that Africa is dependent, that we lack the agency. So because we understand about narratives, that they, they, um, they evolve through stories. We essentially work with storytellers. That's what African Nefilta does. And we do a couple of things. We give grants, we give grants to storytellers. We give grants to people who are working and supporting storytellers to make the ecosystem around storytellers a little bit more robust. We um, do a lot of research. We've got some really interesting projects going on. Um, and we're, I guess two other things we do is that we do a lot of advocacy around better representation, like represent Africa as we are, not, as this old fashioned way. Um, and so those are pretty much the things we do. Um, and the biggest thing for us is really, really we're trying to build a community because we know we are not the only ones. Well, look, there's, there's a bunch of us on this um, webinar right now. So the idea is to bring 
this field together because we are stronger when we collaborate. We're stronger when we're together. Our voice is bigger. So that's something that African Porter is really working hard to do. So I'm going to hand back to you in theory. That's what I do. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work we, you do with Africa No Filter. Um, we have been beneficiaries and partners and we see you and we hear you and we celebrate you and your team because it's not easy work, right? Um, entrenched perceptions, entrenched stereotypes. And unfortunately, some of us have imbibed these external stereotypes even within our own continent. Um, so thank you. Uh, let's move on to Nkiru. Please tell us a bit about your work and uh, what you've been able to achieve so far. Um, thanks, Ndudi, and thanks for that, Moki, and we're happy who's coming. Um, really privileged to be here, and um, Ndudi yourself um, have been doing incredible work for really over 20 years. And I think we all stand in this together, that our stories are not, um, you know, have been told from different perspectives that are not ours. So I am the founder of Africa Self Power Group, which is an umbrella organization of three um, companies. African Women on Board, um, Africa Soft Power Global, and the Africa Soft Power Project. And I'll talk very briefly about those um, organizations. We actually started as African Women on Board because my core thing is women's leadership um, and including African women's voices in mainstream conversations. When you look at all the conversations that are happening around us, we are always perceived from a poverty perspective. When you look at media around us, you see you know, really, really poor people, really poor children. And those are real stories indeed but obviously not balanced. So, and generally from our perspective, African women are usually at the very bottom of any single conversation. We don't even count. And so from our perspective on African women on board is how do we then include African women in those core critical global conversations, whether it's climate change, whether it's gender equality, whether it's ESG, um, supply chains, all of that. And then we um, became Africa Soft Power like uh, two years later, because again, from our perspective, the creative industries and technology offer Africa's youth the biggest opportunities. So the question is, how do you then define or redefine infrastructure to include young people? And so my background is intellectual property. My thesis when I was at uni was actually the um, perception of um, Nollywood, uh, um, sort of gender in Nollywood. And then I, my background was in music. I was a CEO of a, a music company. And so that led to the conversation around using intellectual property, using creative industries to propel Africa forward, to define Africa differently. We think that the creative industry and technology offers Africa its biggest opportunity because it employs young people and the barriers to ent entry are you know, not as high as you know, maybe if you were gonna be looking at medicine and all of that. And so hence the conversation around Africa Soft Power Group, we're focused on women's leadership and creative industries to propel Africa forward. That's it from me, over. Thank you so much. You know, I often tell people when I speak about Africa food change makers, that we're changing the face of Africa from a hungry child to a dynamic female entrepreneur. So speaking your language in Kiru, um, and I'm so excited about the work you do. And I know you have a convening coming up in Rwanda. I'm going to give a so soft plug uh, for those of you who can join. Uh, they're having an amazing convening in Rwanda at the end of May um, to really propel the unique voices. And I think the creative industry is such a powerful vehicle because in spite of the barriers, our music is getting to the global stage, right? Our movies are getting out there and they're telling a more nuanced story about Africa. So well done to you and the team. Now, Muhaki, please tell us a bit about your work and what impact you've made in the ecosystem. Great, thank you so much, Ndidi. And it's wonderful to be with you all this afternoon from Nairobi, Kenya, but I know that you know we represent the globe here. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Muhaki and I love to tell stories. That's me in a nutshell. And <laughs> I come from a long history of stories. Um, when I was young, I was just a bookworm, but in time I've taken that and now I use that as my superpower. So for very many years, I worked in the field of public health, advancing um, social change through, you know, impacting people through better quality lives, um, both in service delivery and then later in funding. And I think that what came to me through my journeys across this beautiful content, continent of ours is that um, we don't see ourselves as grandly as we should, right? And it's funny how, you know, me traveling as a Kenyan to West Africa, I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And then I'd come back home and I'd be like, 
wait, we also have this. Um, and so that led to my own transition about um, seven, eight years ago to founding Paukwa. Paukwa is a sweet Swahili word that is the call of the storyteller. And what we do is that we use digital platforms to curate, to distribute, and to celebrate our African selves, both the history from which we've come from, because also we know that our histories are very truncated, they're very narrow in terms of our journey to where we are now. And then also just the people who we are today. And we do that because if not us, then who? We can't get upset about other people not telling our story. It's not their business, but it is ours. And so Paukwa does that every single day on social media. We unapologetically tell positive Kenyan stories because we figure that there's enough negative ones out there. And our legacy is to leave a digital footprint about positive Kenya, um, because we also know that less than 4% of all the continent, all the content in the world is actually African. So we want to help skew it towards the positive. And then we work with social change practitioners from different countries to help them formulate and tell their story in an exciting way, whether it's through documentation, whether it's through telling pictures about their work, whether it's through podcast, whatever it is, we're here to bring progress to the fore. Thank you so much. And just in the spirit of Catalyst, so Catalyst is a community of change agents. One example is how we have partnered, the four women in this group, especially the three. So with funding from Siegel and African o Filter, we engage Kukua stories to tell amazing stories about some of our value chains, Tef, Roybus, uh, Okra, Coco, Coco, and Coffee, um, elevating the voices of our entrepreneurs. So thank you to both of you, super women. Uh, we've made it happen and it's in the public domain and it's making a difference. I so, actually think we should be supporting you directly if we're not already. Honestly, exactly. Your work is spot on, you are our community. So let's definitely talk. Absolutely, Moki. <laughs> That's exactly what a, one of the reasons <laughs> I was live and direct. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. She's doing amazing work. And I've, I've been wanting to connect the two of you. So that's part of the magic of the Catalyst platform. So now moving on to social entrepreneurs. So some data that really worries me, which I've been speaking about loudly on the global stage, is that only about 5.6% of global funding goes to African social entrepreneurs and local organizations, and only 14% of funding from African philanthropists goes to African social entrepreneurs. That's dismal, right? And when you ask these philanthropists why they don't fund local social entrepreneurs, they tell you, number one, they don't know them. Number two, they don't trust them. Number three, you know, they, they just don't think they can deliver. And that's the danger of the single story when it comes to narratives, right? Because there's so many amazing social entrepreneurs at the grassroots in our countries doing great work, but can't get the funding. We are committed through Africa Forward to changing that narrative because we believe that the entrepreneurs who are doing great work on the ground. Now I'm coming to you, Mwaki, because you have been a funder, right? Uh, you are the Rockefeller Foundation. You understand the funding landscape. What can we do? to change the narrative, that we don't have strong social innovators on the ground? What can we do to alter these stories and shift the funding to where it matters the most and where it can deliver impact on the ground the most? So I think that the solution will be twofold. I think that a lot of social entrepreneurs and people who are in the weeds of the work often just don't have the capacity to do good communications. Two things about that. One, it's money. It tells, it, it takes money to tell a good story, right? And two, it also takes skills. If I'm working at, you know, delivering water, if I'm working at, you know, in agriculture, I'm so focused on doing that work well in a highly complex um, uh, environment that there's very little time that I actually have towards um, being able to invest and tell my story. However, I think that funders have to, now on the other side of it, I think that funders have to start to realize that, you know what, they are but one piece of the puzzle. Money is a necessary but insufficient propeller of change. Social change is also not arithmetic. It is not one plus one is equal to two. Social change is algebra, right? So two X plus Y squared is equal to, you know, Z cubed. And the reason why I say that is because 
Each of these elements require very specific and different resources to actually bring change about. And for funders, I think that they need to start to recognize that, that they can have the money, but if they don't have the contextual and relevant information about how change happens in Benin, in Togo, in Kenya, right? Then they won't be able to move that forward. And neither will people who are coming from outside of that locality, all with the very, very best of intentions, right? The way that people used to talk to me as an African from other, from, from other African countries was very different from how they used to talk to my colleagues from New York. And that's just the reality of the world that we live in, right? That we have the opportunity to overcome these cultural sort of um, barriers, but we have to be intentional, intentional about trusting the people who are in position and then also allowing them to be able to tell their story. And the last thing that I'm going to say is that this work doesn't take place overnight. But at the same time, you cannot tell me that this, can, that this continent is not full of amazing individuals whose capacity has already been built and who are ready to actually do the work. And so what we're saying now is that, try us. Try us because it's time. Because if you're not, then it also means that all those capacity building initiatives that have been funded for decades really don't work. And we don't believe that. Thank you. So we need to change our own approach to telling our stories. Donors need to also fund storytelling <laughs> and come out of the woodwork to fund it. But we also need to start being more direct about us and, and basically demanding for some of these changes to happen. Um, and that's why, you know, working together, we can do more than working in isolation. Coming to you, Unki, from your own experience, obviously bringing organizations together under this umbrella, um, what needs to change and what can we do collectively and individually to shift the narrative and to elevate our voices? Um, so I sort of come at social change or systems change from uh, um, maybe a different direction, which I think complements the existing direction. I sort of have a theory around the development space. Um, I think that the, the, the social sector and the way that we've framed it for the continent has not really been successful in terms of always framing everything from a, public, a poverty um, perspective. So when you look at you know, all the donors or multilaterals or really everything it really is all, all, always all to rescue us from poverty. And when you're literally framing, and that's decades and decades of work, and when, you know, we don't want to name foundations or anything, but it's just decades of where, you know, on the receiving end of aid and charity and all of that, which has its place, but the conversation has to be shifted. Because when you think about, you know, social entrepreneurship and all the conversations around real growth, um, people have to see that we are up to the task, we're equals, Whereas we're constantly, I don't know if you guys saw the um, um, brutal interview at the Mo Ibrahim um, 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 the thing that happened in Kenya just recently. And he talked about how we always go with, you know, a cup looking at, you know, they say America says, you know, come to America and 54 African leaders go with no strategy and go to America. And France is going to come say, come to France, and we go with our little buckets to beg, and we go with no strategy again. And so, um, um, Indidi and I were at the US Africa Leaders Summit, and it seemed really like it was a bit chaotic, but what, it wasn't clear what the African strategy was. And so, in terms of our work at Africa Sub Power, collaboration is really essential, and sort of like amplifying African thought leadership. Um, really, really, really essential. We're not in the rooms where decisions are being made. Um, and they actually recommended me to a program at Harvard where I was the only African in the room. And I'm, I'm sure at your time, you were the only African in the room. And people are not connected to people like us. They, you know, they were almost alien to those conversations. Meanwhile, there's many of us, like, you know, on this call already, there's thought leaders who are equal to, you know, anybody you'll find in the world, but we have not 
created opportunity for ourselves. We have not been given the opportunity, but we also have to create those opportunities for ourselves. And so from an Africa South Power perspective, Africa Women on Board perspective, it's about gathering those voices, whether it's Moki or Ndidi or Muhaki or really anybody on this call, making sure that we're seen and making sure we're taking our space. We have to command the spaces, but we, have, we don't have our own platforms. We really have to necessarily go to, oh, we're going to DC, we're going to UNGA which are really good you know, um, platforms to go to, but we don't have African platforms that we have created where we are bringing people as equals to our own space and explaining to them how we do things and how we want to do things and what the African context means to the global conversation, but also that Africa does have solutions. You know, um, um, and I, I, I don't want to go on too long. I don't want to hog the microphone, but I met with, uh, um, and this is how many Moki you might be interested in India as well, with a guy who does proverbs. He's written a book of proverbs, African proverbs or Nigerian proverbs to be more exact. And in that proverb, one of them was, you don't go um, to the market. We don't take the cow. Um, you, you don't start feeding the cow on, on the day you want to take it to the market, which really means to us, oh, Rome was not built in a day or however you want to define it. I'd never heard it. It was an evil proverb. And we have these things. We've always had these things. I don't know what happened in the past 50 years to disrupt those conversations that we have always known. We've always understood strategy, but maybe maybe the development space, maybe I don't, I can't, you know, this is something for us to work on how we lost our track, our place in the world, and we have to regain it. And we need our own thought leaders. Like all the people in this room need to be able to take space as opposed to, oh, we're going to the, or, you know, the, the DC or we're going to, to Davos. And we can go to those places, but we need to create our own platforms here on the continent. Sorry, I've, talked, I've spoken too long. Sorry, it's a passion project. No, 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 I, I share your passion and I, I share your frustrations. Um, and we see, I think everybody on this platform understands that the time is now. I recently contributed an article to SSIR, Stanford Social Innovation Review's 20th anniversary, and it was called Shifting the Power Back to African Local Organizations. And I'm unapologetic about the fact that we have to take back that power. We've ceded it um, knowingly or unknowingly, and obviously our politicians continue to cede it, but we as social innovators have to take back that power. Moki, can you um, take, what's your spin on this issue? You have been working with social entrepreneurs. You have been supporting them to amplify their voices. What need, What else can we do to accelerate this work um, and to am amplify it um, 10X because it's going well, but it's too slow? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, both my fellow panelists have made really great points. I think for me, if we if we look at the sort of funding side, which is one of the areas, I think there aren't enough philanthropists in Africa full stop, but the few there are are not really looking to fund. They've almost become implementing agencies themselves. They're actually competing with some of these CSOs and NGOs doing work themselves because they have access and they're actually sort of <laughs> eating some of the money that we as um, um, organizations work on the ground should be doing. So I think that's one, one, one area. But what I do feel with social enterprise, I see a lot of networks that are being created, typically by international organizations, Skoll Forum, the Tutu Fellowship Program, the Mandela Washington, you know, Yali. There's a lot of networks that are coming to Africa to try and sort of identify social impact entrepreneurs because they understand that these guys are the future. They're solving problems and they're trying to make a sustainable living out of it. I feel that we as Africans just need to keep on doing what we're doing. It takes time, but we need to be consistent. So, you know, when I look at these networks, I see that they're building a pipeline. And at some point, African philanthropists will come to the party, but we can't live our life waiting for African money because that ain't going to happen anytime soon. I can tell you, you know, I was at the Mo Ibrahim governance weekend and, you know, a lot of people on one of the opening panels talked about the narrative about Africa. We need to change the narrative. And this is really my point. Nobody on that stage is doing anything about it. In fact, the people on that stage are the ones contributing usually to the negative image because actually typically it's our leaders that get the headlines. And if people are reading those stories, they're not finding out anything positive or new about the continent. What I think we have to do as Africans is we need to start reframing the way we talk about ourselves. We need to talk solutions. I have been to so many conferences where we keep looking at the negative. We keep highlighting the problem we want to solve by highlighting the problem itself. 
we need to actually change the way. And that's actually what we are doing with our advocacy. We're actually trying to tell people, you know what, they're two simple things. You need to tell our stories better. So if you look at something like, you know, um, in Nigeria, when we had NSARS, I would say the way NSARS was told to the world, it was a story of conflict of just chaos in Lagos, but actually, you know, we could have retold the same story as one of the young people taking agency to create change. Same story, different framing. And that's what I ask everyone to do. Do not focus so much on the negative, on the problem you're trying to fix, but much more on the solution that you're offering. And I think that'll take us to another level because that's a single thing that you need to change, the mindset of the way we talk. The glass is half full, not half empty. I completely agree, Moki, completely agree. You know, the Sudan story that's in the media, I saw an article, actually, I was really impressed. I think it was the New York Times that talked about how the gum Arabica industry globally is going to be affected by what's happening in Sudan and that major beverage companies will be at a loss. And I said, that is a different narrative. Sudan produces the largest producer of gum Arabica in the world the second largest producer of sesame in the world. And yet, when you hear the word Sudan, you think of conflict. And so it's, impo it's important for us to really amplify the voices of what's, why is Sudan so important to the world? Why, why does the world, the same way we talked about Ukraine and fertilizer and grains, Sudan produces something everybody needs and it's people deserve that support because their industries matter. And so that's the switch. I, they're obviously coming to this from the food lens, you know, uh, but that's the switch that excites me. So you're right. Now, a question to all of you, there are some specific things we've talked about. I'm not starting any more organizations, please stop me. But we need to get our, our political rulers, I don't call them leaders, Moki, to change the way they talk. Who can do that? It's social innovators, right? Somebody needs to come in and set up an institute that prepares people, Unki, for these global sessions and these global conferences and says, say this, don't say that. I do it with my young people when I'm sending them abroad. Say this, don't say that. Nobody has prepared them, right? We take it for granted, but in other parts of the world, there are governance institutes that prepare people for global stages, prepare them for public speaking, give them talking points, plant people in the room to ask the right questions, to pull out the information. All of that is strategy, communication strategy. Who can step in that gap? Our social innovators, right? How can we help those social innovators do that work? That's one. The second thing I've heard, and this is a question of mine, somebody has to start this organization, is that we need all the African funders who are the leadership of all the major foundations to have a community. We do, the black Americans have that community. Do we have that for black funders, African fund, foundation leadership? Because we need that voice. We need to tell them, what are you going to fund to support this narrative changing? What are you going to fund to uh, trans, uh, reverse the flows? And then the final one I've heard, and Moki, you said this, but do you know that Madonna gets funding from her foundation from African philanthropists? So does Sherry Blair, right? So they are getting funding that my people cannot get because they have credibility. So what do we need to do to be, in Igbo land, we call it Otimu, to be the praise singers for our social innovators so that in the public domain, they seem attractive enough for our African philanthropists. There's some star power associated with them. Who's gonna fill that? So I'm, I'm, throwing this out. I'm throwing this out, but I want you guys to react to these ideas and others because we're all about action at Catalyzing Change Weekend. We wanna come back here next year and say, this is what we did. So Moki, you want to step in first? You know, I, I was just going to just quickly step in and just talk about this, you know, for, uh, African philanthropists funding foreign institutions. DJ Kapi gave a lot of money to Oxford University. Dan Gote gave a huge amount of money to the Africa Center in New York. Money was given to World Economic Forum. These are not African-led, African-born institutions. And I get why they do it. I do get why they do it. But the point is, we cannot wait for them to see the light. We need to start our own institutions. We need to figure it out. And no matter where you get the funding from, you run with it. I have seven US, UK funders funding me to do a project that is a wholly 100% about Africa for Africa. It's a little bit embarrassing, but the point is that I'll take the money where I can get it. And my funders are amazing. But we, get to, we need to get to a stage where 
people understand that these sort of things, because they're often seen as mm, not so important, I'd rather be doing education, building a school here and doing that. But the single thing that needs to change is our mindset. That's the thing that nobody's working on. So I, I just feel that we need, to, we can't go back and highlight the problem. We need to just move ahead and just say, you know, we're doing it. That's my initial response to that. Thank you. Mohaki, what is your response to some of the ideas and throw out a few more because there are going to be people on this platform who will jump on them, right? So, indeed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg to differ about trying to get African philanthropists interested in the work that we do. Because remember that private philanthropy, if I do what I want with my money, right? If I'm an individual philanthropist, if what I want to do is be seen with Madonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to be seen with Madonna. That's where I'm going to put my, that's where I'm going to put my money. I think that the way that we need to do it is instead of trying to deal with the, um, directly with the um, um, philanthropists because they have their own incentives, we need to deal with the social innovators. Shame the philanthropists into that situation where they're meeting people at you know, the World Economic Forum who are being touted as stars in their country and they know nothing about them, right? Those are the people who we need to be giving megaphones to and amplifying the work that they are doing. And I completely agree with Boki. You know, if, if people are giving you money to be able to, to do that, it doesn't matter where the money comes from. It matters what the money is going to do, right? So I, 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 I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, you know, and I wouldn't think twice about, about, about taking it. So my question is, how do we put all these people who are doing fantastic work into the forefront? How do we get them to be the ones writing op-eds beyond our own papers, right? In places where they will be seen by people who want to invest in success. Because I can tell you one thing from my um, years in working in, um, um, in philanthropy is funders chase success. You want your money to be able to you want to, you, in some ways, yes, you want to fund innovation, but you want to fund a safe bet, right? And the same way that African philanthropists are looking for, you know, that celebrity, you know, sort of Madonna um, shine on them, you know, there could be uh, funders from other parts of the world who are looking for, you know, a more, a more nuanced, more uh, people focused sort of shine on them, right? So it really depends on people's legacies, but we cannot, I don't think that we can dictate when it comes to private philanthropy, what that is gonna be. What we need to do is put people in front of them who actually are doing the work. And that's a lot of the work that, that we are doing. We um, recently, we ran a, a, a story series around um, people in Kenya who are contributing to the um, SDGs. So all 17 of them, right? And none of these people, have any spotlight on them, right? So that's also part of our intention, that if you've been in the papers, imagine you're not going to be the person who will be spotlight because we're doing this for two reasons. One, to amplify un un underserved voices, but two, to also show young Kenyans that there's a plethora of role models who they can actually um, look up to. It's not just the five, 10 people whose names they always see in the traditional media. So we need more people um, to actually think about, let's love ourselves and let's toot our own horn and let's be an African about doing that. Because you know, for a lot of us culturally, you're not supposed to talk about yourselves and you know, say what wonderful work you are, you, are, you are doing. If you wanna play on a global stage, we need to get over that particular barrier and be comfortable. You know, Like I said, be like the Nigerians. They they're like, do you know who I am? Huh? <laughs> So my East African brothers and sisters, we have work to do, but we, where we are ready to learn. I love that. Celebrating the unsung heroes, celebrating those who are at the forefront doing good work, amplifying their voices. We just launched something called uh, Leading Women in Food Fellowship, and that's exactly the idea. How can we celebrate more African women doing good work and increase their visibility within their countries and globally? Um, so well done. Um, and and it, not every Nigerian wants to toot their horn. So even in our own ecosystem, we have to teach those who do the work how to cel get celebrated. Those who make the loudest noise in our ecosystem usually are not doing the work. <laughs> Sorry to say. <laughs> so we need to switch that. Unki, what about you? What have you seen that's working and what can we do to amplify it? So um, I think um, to the point of the points I've already been raised, and when we started, um, I first started as a consulting firm and our job was actually um, training for um, 
um, um, high level corporates and government officials. So we've actually sort of like worked with quite a few of the presidential aspirants and also to people in terms of um, training and uh, in, uh, in, in how they engage with media. So when you think about Obama or Angela, Merkel or anybody who's in front of TV, they don't just go, they prep. And that's one of the things that African leaders have not, or should we say rulers have not um, 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 been able to do. Um, and that was a point that Muki made about NSARS. And that's one of, I, I forgot about it, but when she talked about it, it's still one of my most annoying things that's happened in since we started African Women on Board. So when NSARS happened, we actually did have a program which Aisha, Aisha Sustay, Bella Niger, and Edo Bubi partnered on. And we were the first reporters in front of it. We were um, you know, at it every day for the, for the duration. And Aisha was reporting live. I mean, obviously it was virtual in terms of the reporting, but we were on it. And then even with a Nigerian perspective, um, she did an incredible job, incredible job. Uh, um, um, a week later, because CNN didn't carry the story for a while, a week later, or a couple of days later, uh, um, CNN carried the story and some of the um, international media then started carrying the story. And suddenly, even Nigerians, Africans were saying, well done, CNN, well done for doing this, well done for seeing us. We were there from the beginning. We had files, we had DJ and Switch, we had all of the people. Nobody said well done to Aisha or AWB or Bella Niger. So the point that Moki was making, I totally, you know, like we don't, we'd rather go and sort of spend the money in America and fund, you know, uh, um, and, you know, one of the institutions when we have really incredible institutions here that are doing really incredible work. So I think we're all sort of like speaking to ourselves and we're preaching to the choir. Uh, um, we, 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 I think, my mom says, sweep the front of your yard. And if everybody swept the front of their yard, then we would have a clean street. And I think what's happening with our, you know, our rulers and people who are in leadership here are maybe something happened when they were being raised. They've not actually understood that we have to sweep the front of our yard and we can't move anywhere as a continent if we don't actually see ourselves first, if we don't collaborate. Um, and again, that whole idea of when an Oyibo person does it, it's better. It's something we need to um, we need to actually move away from because it's also something that's sort of keeping us keeping us behind. And that NSAT story is something that really upset me till today because I think um, Christina Mampo got a lot of praise, and I think she might have gotten an award for reporting it, or at least gotten a lot of praise. Aisha was in front of in front of it way before, and nobody congratulated her. So I just think about you know the the the, the way the world treats. Uh, um, Africa, as it, uh, you know, as opposed to the rest of the world. So that's my um, my little thing. But we have to keep striving, and that's what we're trying to do at Africa so far. Uh, again, we're going to be in Rwanda, and our core thing is propelling African thought leadership. So really, like, who are the voices? Whether it's in media, whether it's in finance, who are the people who are doing interesting things, and how do we sort of like amplify their voices? We also used to work with Wikimedia, Wikipedia, and to actually write stories about African women. Uh, um, and create their bios for them. It's a lot of work because we just have not understood how to actually tell, you know, relatable stories to the media. And that's something that we should actually look at um, doing again. We don't have the capacity anymore because it's, it's a lot of capacity from us. But those are the kind of things in terms of, oh, how do we profile ourselves in a way that creates that African thought leadership where if they're calling uh, um, a top leader, they're calling Mark Zuckerberg, they're calling an African who can speak on that level. And there's many, many of us. Great. So in terms of, I mean, great ideas, great work, how can we leverage the diaspora to amplify our voices as well? You know, some following up on this NSARS, theme, I was reflecting on the fact that the MBA at the time reached out to me to say, we have so many African players on the MBA, how can they get involved? And I realized they have star power. Um, how can we leverage the diaspora populations to tell our stories? How can we leverage diaspora populations to amplify our stories? I just went to this conference called Black Women in Food in DC, and I met so many African publicists who said, we don't know about your work but would love to publicize your work here in the US. Um, is, this, is there momentum that we can build on? Moki, um, have you interacted with these communities and how can we build bridges with them? One, one thing Africa No Filter is clear about is that our work is for and about Africans wherever they are. So we do include the diaspora. And I think they're really important, really critical 
um, I guess, audience as well, because actually we have to stop assuming that every single diasporan is a good ambassador for Africa, because sometimes they're not, right? Because they left Africa and they left, you know, whatever. But I do think that there is a wave and a moment now that's happening. It's cool. Africa is cool. Look at our music. Look at our fashion. Look at our artists. They seem to be dominating now. So there's a, you know, cool Africanness. And that's where I think the diasporans can really help take that message and broaden it beyond Africans in the diaspora to, you know, to your workmates. I mean, I, I think there's a guy that always sort of gave this example when he really knew that Africa had landed in America as he was walking on Fifth Avenue. He went into like some designer store and they were playing Afrobeats. Right. So to him, it was like, wow. So I, I think that's one really important thing that we, we need to keep engaged with our diaspora cousins. And it's not just first generations. You know, I was at a um, session where we we're talking about the, the highest concentration of Africans outside of Africa is in Brazil. We often forget that. We often forget that Brazilians, Colombians, in Africans in India, all of these places, they think more about us as Africans than we actually think about them because they left a long time ago. And there's, there's a desire to connect back to the continent. And we don't often actually see that. We think, okay, they've gone. So I think that's something we need to do. But the one thing I really believe that we should be doing, and it's a very simple thing, and it's about proverbs, because I use it a lot, is that until lions learn to write, hunters will tell their stories for them. We literally just have to tell our stories. We literally just have to tell more of them but we need to make sure that they're in the right spaces. Because I think it's really important that, you know, if our stories are floating around in Nigeria, but they're not being seen, that's as, almost as good as not having a story out there. We need to figure out how we connect to global markets. We're in the same conversation spaces the decision makers are using to make their judgments about Africa. So I think that's really important. And I'm gonna say one last thing. African Thought to launched a story platform. It's a news agency, exactly like Reuters or, um, you know, Bloomberg. And what we do is we essentially write stories that, you know, those organizations don't write about. So they are supposed to be the stories that just often get left on, on, on told. But I can tell you, we don't get a lot of people saying, hey, come and cover us, come and cover, cover us. We don't. We're actually having to say, what's happening in your country? Go and tell us, go and see, go and find. And I feel that we need to get into that habit of saying, hey, somebody could be interested in this. And sometimes we're so busy in the work or busy doing whatever we do, we don't realize that the communications and getting our work makes it easier for you to do your work because you have visibility, you'll get people funding, you'll get people understanding what you do. It's a really critical part of what a social impact entrepreneur needs to do. They need to build in that PR component right into their program from the start. I'll stop there. Thank you. Any other um, ideas on this topic before we open it up for questions? I was just gonna say what Moki said. <laughs> but, awesome. Awesome. but I do want to just add something about the power of writing the soft stuff, right? Like, like, like Moki alluded to, right, right now, Afrobeats is everything. Yeah. I look at my teenage daughters and that's, that's all that they listen to. And they can tell me A to, A to Z about um, West African artists in a way that they could never do about, about US artists. And so for me, what excites me is that there's this shift also within our African young populations, the movies that they watch, the music that they listen to, the footballers who they're following, it's a very different reality than what was, um, than what was in place, you know, for me, you know, when, when, when I was growing up, whereas, you know, then the focus was look to the West, you want to be like the West. Now it is filtered with everything. They want, you know, they're watching K-pop dramas. They're watching, you know, um, artists from um, Asia, but they're also looking at things which are happening in Africa. And my question is, as people who are in the business of advancing social progress and social change, to what extent are we harnessing these soft elements? How do we use them to be ambassadors of the work that's happening here? Yeah. So which, fo which footballer, right? Is, is, is talking about the work which is happening in his country, yeah? Which marathon runner from Kenya is also elevating, you know, places like Iten, so that it's not just that runners come from Kenya, but also people can come and train in Kenya. We need to start shifting how we see economic opportunities within our country. So it's not just always looking at what the West would experience. I get excited when I talk, when I see um, adverts about Kenya that are no longer just talking about wildlife. Right, because wildlife is exciting from people who don't come from countries where there's wildlife. Yeah, 
But for somebody who's coming from Botswana, for somebody who's coming from South Africa or from, or from, or from Senegal, what is the draw that will come and make them spend their money here? Right? And that is what we need to start focusing on in terms of shifting the narrative to stories that also encourage other people from the continent to look at us differently. And in so doing, we build all of us. So we need a video to adopt Leap Africa, and we need uh, Trevor Manuel to adopt Africa Food Change Makers. I mean, that's, they can use their platforms and we can get millions and millions of supporters. So Nki, what do we need to do to make that happen? You've, you've worked in the entertainment industry. I mean, and I still work in the entertainment industry and we are doing, and to be honest, that's exactly why we set up Africa Soft Power. I think the, um, the uh, what Muki was talking about in terms of the Brazilian, I think she was a speaker at Africa Soft Power, I think the first year or second year. And this is where you know, that conversation was had, where we had, we've had Brazilians, Colombians, you know, South America has the biggest amount of black people living uh, you know, outside of the continent. And so we've had these voices. Um, one of those speakers we had was a high ranking American who talked about this was the first time that she had been in the same room with Africans that, that you know, she didn't you know, she said, I didn't know that the Africans were like this. What she meant was that her experience of Africa or her knowledge, because, you know, we think, oh, it's only these people that see us, but even Africans or black Americans or black people outside of the continent sort of have a different opinion of us as well. So she said, I didn't know that Africans were like this. But what she meant was she hadn't experienced you know, being in a room on the same session where people are talking serious sense as thought leaders and would be, you know, perfect in any room in the world. She hadn't experienced that. And so that's really, really um, um, a core thing for us in terms of, um, you know, there's actually people who are doing really incredible things in the sports. We're partnering with the Basketball Africa Live in Rwanda. So people who are coming can watch, you know, um, the NBA Africa games when they come to Rwanda. And we have conversations around sports, around food. We've, we've hosted um, Africa Food Chain Bakers on ASB as well. And we have those conversations. And the point is to keep amplifying those conversations because there are people who are doing really incredible things. And there are people who are doing exceptional things in sports, in fashion, in all of those spaces. And I think our job as well is to find them. So we sort of like tend to also, not only do we work in silos, we think in silos. We think that, oh, we're the only ones doing great things. It's not true. There's people doing exceptional things. And my challenge to this room is actually for us, which we are doing, but even do so more. Like I shouldn't leave this you know, um, space without knowing what Muhaki does. I didn't know of her to, um, until today. And I must, I'm like, what? I didn't know of her. She has to come to Africa so far because our job is to make her voice even bigger. Because when you come, you will see people are doing exceptional things in sports, in music. And there's a story around connecting to the private sector, um, using finance and private capital to propel Africa. And so look at you know when Burner Boy sold out Madison Square and there being a, people, a few people who have done really incredible things. So the way I look at it is like, think about Warren Buffett and he watches that, he sees Bonner Boy on TV in America. He's suddenly thinking, ah, oh, Nigeria is cool, not 419, you know? And that's how immediately you can actually connect the money to the creative industries. And it's this kind of thinking where, you know, when Obama would be rapping um, and doing stuff and he's a politician. It's like, how do you connect to young people, young minds? And so these are the things that we need to be looking at from a positive perspective. But there are actually people who are doing incredible things, including your Kenyan Enda, we have a, um, a Mohaki, there's a, a woman who's um, on Africa Sapa who has the only running shoes um, made out of the continent. Enda, <laughs> Navalaya, you do know and her? You should, I wear her brand, she's used me, because I think it's fantastic. I only wear Enda running shoes. Yes. I only wear Enda running I shoes. I mean, we should only wear Enda running shoes. And so she's yeah, going to be Enda. Africa Sapa <laughs> doing a, um, a demo and she's looking for African investors. These are the kind of things we need to be talking about because there's quite a number of us doing incredible things. Sorry, you know, Fantastic. Can I just add one more thing? Because, you know, in a previous career, I used to work for the Gates Foundation. And I remember when Bill would come to South um, Africa, you'd put some stuff and you'd sort of be participate in the writing of a speech. And he was always very good at picking out individuals. Like I know, you know, he, he'll pick out an individual, somebody we've supported, like a name. 
Um, Obama has been good at that, at that as well. He picks out certain individuals on Africa doing amazing things. He's never met them, but you know, speechwriters have put those names in there. And I actually think that our leaders have the access that we want. They're getting to speak and, and be on platforms where we want to be. We need to make sure that the names of people who are doing amazing things somehow work their way into those speeches so that we get that access on those public platforms. And that's the thing that I think is, is missing. I cannot think of a single African leader that has mentioned in his speech, somebody from his country that is doing an amazing thing. And I think that little opening opportunity just shines a light. We need hundreds of these little lights being, being shone. And that's where we start building a powerful pipeline beyond the sort of, you know, organizations that are, are building their pipelines, like talk about Mandela Washington, you know, Skull Forum and things like that. And I feel that's a simple little fix. If we can do that, it's really a big start. I love all these ideas, the passion, the energy. Clearly, there are many, many takeaways. We are almost out of time, but I'm going to take one or two questions. If you can please put your question or comments in the chat um, so that we can have the panelists react to them. I'm taking away a few things while I wait for the questions. One of them is that clearly one of the key takeaways for Africa Forward is to think about how to bridge the gap between uh, social innovators, our entertainers, our private sector, um, and amplify those stories. We have storytellers on the continent who are doing amazing work. How can we get the names and those stories into those platforms? How can we ensure that those who are representing us on the global stage have these stories, have these names? How can we prepare them to shine the light as well? How can we build stronger bridges with the diaspora? They have the funding, they have the credibility. They don't have to start their own foundations. They can partner and adopt local foundations, the same with our celebrities. So there's so much, so much rich content coming out. I'm waiting for questions. I'm can waiting. I say while we're yes, waiting go for ahead. Questions? And it's one, a challenge to the to the community, right? Um, but also, uh, 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 what do I call it? A, a comfort, I hope, to those who are in the trenches, right? To those social innovators. Um, work takes a long, change takes a long time to happen, right? I always look at uh, the way that Wagari Mathai is celebrated on an international stage. And I love that she got that in um, 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 recognition. But the Green Belt movement was 30 years in the making before she got that worldwide recognition. It wasn't easy. She got beaten up. She was constantly under house arrest. She was, I mean, it was a fight all the way all along. But the legacy, of course, finally took place. And so my challenge to people within the community is this. Who is the person who is unseen? The person who's really just slogging away. If we have the opportunity to go with them, to fund them, to bring them into the space where, on a, you know, in a, in a conversation where, where we are, I implore you, don't go with a big organization or the person who you trust to, you know, who knows how to navigate these spaces. Let us be each other's helper and bring that person into, into these spaces. Yeah. You never know who you're sitting up. Yeah. I love that. I love that. You know, it's so true. It's so true. We have a few questions. One from Adanne. Can we have these women like yourselves doing amazing, be mentors to younger women and grow too? Um, another one is, how can we tell effective stories when you don't have the resources or equipment? From Nuhan, um, I'll just rush through them that we've gotten. Betsy asked, how do we address small organizations doing big things and how do they gain the visibility and get funded? Um, are they often visible to philanthropists within Africa and global? So I would say in your closing remarks, please try to address some of these questions that have come in, in the chat. Um, and we'll do one round of closing remarks and then I'll wrap us up. Uh, so let's start with you and Kiru. Um, so um, I, I would say how to tell effective stories and when you don't have resources is to be consistent. And that just understanding that um, I'll use the African um, version, which is you're not going to take a cow um, that you want to sell, a fatted cow, and start fattening the cow on that same day. You'd have to understand that strategy. It takes work. We're toiling. It sounds like we're you know all having fun, but we're not. We're toiling. It's almost 20 hour days working really hard, and just keep to the vision. And if you keep at it, it will be frustrating. You want to give up many times. But I think that three years, four years, five years, you start finding that um, the strategy is working. But I think also one of the things I would say to Africans, to ourselves, is that 
we have to have big visions. We tend to sort of like are quite micro in our thinking. We have to think about if you want to tell a story, what's your big vision? And then it will take time. I'm mapping that time and giving it a time it needs. And I think that's what separates us from the West in terms of it, nothing is overnight. I personally don't get frustrated when we don't get African leaders supporting us because we know that we just keep going at it and going at it. And then, you know, one day it feels like you just didn't, um, you just woke up, but it didn't just happen. It was like three years or five years or seven years. And I think that would be my consistent, my story consistency and we just keep collaborating and keep having this kind of conversations I find them to be helpful because you connect with the um, you connect with networks and you build bigger visions for the continent thank you so much and if I can tell you one thing about Nki she doesn't take no for an answer and she believes in collaborations global collaborations local collaborations Ford Foundation hosting events in New York during Ankara, National Absolutely. Geographic hosting events during the African Leaders Summit and pulling everyone to the table. And so that's a message I've learned from Nki that's very, very vital here, is partner with others to amplify your voice and don't take no fun answer. So thanks for Nki for all the work you do. We see you, we hear you, we applaud you. Muhaki, let's move to you. So I'm going to pick up from what you were saying and just say, um, I do want to answer the question of how can those who don't have resources start to tell their story? Just start. Just start. When Paupa started, we started on Facebook. And why? Because people go to Facebook every day. Well, back then. <laughs> you know, so instead of trying to figure out how to put ourselves in front of people, we went to where they are. And I promise you, right? The, the threshold for what gets out as documentation these days has become um, more and more accessible. With your phone, as you're doing your work, as you're impacting, you know, as you're working with some of your, um, um, whether it's students, whether it's farmers, wherever it is, carry your phone, take a video, right? Put that up on, on your feed. What surprised us along the way is that eventually we found out that we were the answer to somebody else's prayer. And it was only because we were actually putting out the stories that we were. Somebody came to us and said, actually, you know what? I want to do value-based stories with children. And I was wondering, these stories which you write, can you write them for children? And we were like, fantastic. We're happy to do that. The only reason they found us is because we started. So I would say, while you're waiting to get the resources to hire the fancy communications consultant, take your phone, just start. I love it. <laughs> and then what? And then ask Moki for money. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you two things about Haki, Muhaki that I have learned over the last 10 years, I think, that I've known you is first, she's an effective communicator, one of the strongest communicators oh, I know. No. On a, a, any platform that you put her on, she shines bright because she has built her own internal communication capacity. And I think we as change agents and social innovators have to work on how we communicate. You know, verbally, uh, written communication, our presence. And then the second secret power she has is humility. If you're an effective storyteller, you listen. You know, you don't believe you know it all. You listen. And you listen for what is not being said. And I think for social innovators, that's something we can take from her life and her success. So well done. I applaud you, my sister. I see you. I hear you. Keep up the good work. And last but not the least, Moki. What are your closing thoughts and in response to the questions and others? The first one is don't come to Moki for money. So let me tell you off <laughs> because we don't have all the money in the world. And actually it goes back to that thing. If you're waiting around looking for money, you're never going to start. So I think that, that just really two things I want to um, talk about. One is data because African and Forty, we really want to be evidence-based and data-driven because it's very easy to just focus on storytelling, it's very nebulous and it's nice to have, but once you put data behind it, and I think um, in terms of you talk, but one of you talked about the amount of data or sort of amount of stories about Africa, or amount of content on Africa there. I know for a fact, because we're doing some work with Wikimedia, there is something like more about Paris as a city on Wikipedia than there is about Africa as a continent. There is more information about Paris, which is just a city. And of all the content written about Africa that's available on Wikimedia, it's only something like 4% of it is generated by Africans. So we really need to change a game. But what I do know is that if there is not a lot of content, written content on the internet, chat GPT, AI, all of this stuff is coming up. If we don't fix it, we are gonna have a problem. 
we're going to have a problem. So not only do we have to for image purposes, but moving into the future, our voices are not going to be heard on all of these tech innovations that are coming up if we don't do something about it now. That's the, that's the first most important thing for me. We need to change it. We're doing one in video, apparently. Our video content is great, and there's a lot of video stuff, but we also have to kind of look at the written stuff. That's the first thing. The second, second thing that you, know, you guys just touched on and just how we communicate, because it's one thing to tell a story, but if that story is not interesting and it's not compelling, it may as well not be there. I happen to be at the school forum um, in Oxford where they introduced, and I'd never heard him speak before, he is the mayor of Maryland. I mean, I don't know if you know, it's, it's, it's this governor, guy came up, yes. governor of Maryland, sorry. He was so polished. Because I, I didn't know who he was. By the time I walked out of that, I'd have voted for him if there was a way for me to vote for him because he he had his clear message. He knew what we were saying. He probably said that speech a hundred times, but it was fresh to me. And I think our leaders need to start understanding that the African way where you mumble words quietly, you wait for people to lean into you, to hear you. You think because you're a president, therefore your words automatically carry weight. No, it doesn't. We do actually have to work on our communication style. And I find that there's opportunity for us to just elevate our game in terms of our leaders often just being in that space because they have that space, right? So yeah, I, I completely agree that we need to kind of recognize communications and storytelling as a critical skill set. It's part of the armory. It's part of the armory. And I think right now it's seen as, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's what's African Ostalta and Nyakia and all these other people storytelling. It's not us. We deal with hard economic stuff. And I think we need to change that because it really is important. So those are two thoughts that I will, I will leave with because I think everybody said, said the same. And I always used to say, I don't want to be on panels where everybody agrees, but this has been fabulous. We all agree. So it's <laughs> Thank you so much, Moki. I'm going Sorry. to add a reminder to, to, to what Moki said. There's actually a fireside chat on Thursday about chat GBT and its implications for the global South. Please go for that because we will be raised and we need to be aware. We, we need to be aware that this issue is happening um, um, live, live. So yes. Absolutely. In the, Thank in you so much. Thank you. I think the sense of urgency that Moki has brought us to recognize is critical, and Muhaki just amplified that. There is a sense of urgency. We must act now. We must tell our stories, and we must do it collaboratively. Uh, one thing I'll say about Moki as I round up is, Moki, I've followed you from media to acting, to foundation work, and now to where you are sitting on the other side of the table, actually amplifying the voices of others. And that work is amazing. You walk into rooms and you own it. So thank you for being such a positive representation of Africa on the global stage. We honor you and we applaud your work. So to my sisters, this has been an amazing panel. We've all been challenged and inspired. Uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you to Wando and the team at Catalyst for bringing us all together. Enjoy the rest of your day and get to work. Time is now. And if not us, who? All the best. God bless you all.